In Austria, Joseph Fritzl is in his 80s and serving a life sentence for holding his daughter captive in an underground cellar for 24 years, where she was raped and beaten and gave birth to seven children. Today we look at a similar case, one where a man used his position of power against his own stepdaughter. This is the case of the Irish Joseph Fritzl. Mary Manning was born in 1964 in North East Ireland. Little Mary would describe her childhood as charmed. Along with her brother Ricky, she led a carefree existence and though they didn't realize it at the time, they were lucky children. Mary's father was a successful businessman and her mother Mona was seen as a glamorous woman who was full of life. However, this happy lifestyle would be short-lived for Mary. When her father was diagnosed with cancer and quickly passed away, Mary was only nine years old. Devastated by the loss of her father, things quickly went from bad to worse when Mary's mother brought home her new husband, Sean McDarby, with whom she had been having an affair with when Mary's father was alive. Neither Mary nor Ricky knew anything about McDarby's existence until he arrived into their home as their stepfather, but he set about determining the dynamic immediately. He methodically set about humiliating and belittling Ricky, but McDarby was very different with the 10-year-old Mary, and he started grooming her from the minute he met her. McDarby spoiled Mary, made her feel uncomfortable with over-the-top flattery and made somewhat of a pet of her. Mary knew deep in her gut that it was wrong, but she didn't know why and how until he raped her. McDarby told Mary that no one would believe her while Mary's mother Mona assumed an attitude of ignorance and she began to drink heavily. Mary said that she believed her mother used alcohol to block everything out, Mary stated. She heard stories she knew I was very angry with her for a long time. I was more angry with her than I was with him because she was my mother. You only have one mother. I spent a lot of years being angry with her. One person that did try to save Mary from the clutches of McDarby was her parental grandfather known as Old Paul. He took to the streets of Avdi with a handwritten placard saying, my grandchildren are being abused. Old Paul had been a respectful figure in the town at one stage, but since his son's death and his daughter-in-law's remarriage, he had hit the bottle and so wasn't taken seriously as he ranted and raged around the town shouting about how his late son's children were being mistreated. For his one-man protest efforts, old Paul was arrested and bound to the peace. Mary believed that it was her mother who involved the guards. Unfortunately, nobody believed old Paul and nobody believed Mary. Old Paul was the only person who ever tried to help Mary and her younger brother Ricky and he never got to speak to his grandchildren again after the day with the placard. He worked as a lollipop man in the town, but Mary had to walk past him silently, scared even to look at him for fear of how she'd be punished at home. After years of being repeatedly raped and beaten, Mary became pregnant at 16 years of age and gave birth to her first child with her stepfather, a boy called Rory. Her mother berated her for getting pregnant but no one asked about the father and McDarby's name did not go on the birth certificate. Mary can't remember if her mother bothered to ask who the father was when she even became pregnant for a second time. Mary miscarried that baby at home and evil McDarby forced Mary to put the deceased baby in a bag and he buried the child in a carlo field where they remain today. When Mary became pregnant for a third time, McDarby took her away from RD and set up home in a house in the middle-class North Dublin suburb of Castle Rock. Her third baby was a daughter she named Ashley, and four months after Ashley was born, Mary was pregnant again. This time she would have another girl she named Isolt. She barely saw a doctor in any of her pregnancies, as the priority wasn't her well-being or that of the children, but instead keeping McDarby's role in them a secret. Mary said, I was dropped off to give birth at different hospitals, got very little antenatal care at all, so nobody would ask any questions. Poor tormented Mary, who lived in such fear that she slept with a hammer under her pillow, had no communication with the outside world and was given no money. Although McDarby didn't live with Mary and the children, she couldn't escape or try to get help as her tormentor could turn up at any time, which he often did, beating and raping her to remind her who was the boss. 
McDarby broke her mind and spirit to the point that she believed she was to blame, she was at fault, and she didn't deserve any better. Mary was skilled at surviving the ongoing abuse and agony, but the pregnancy and birth of her fourth child, Andrew, nearly broke her. She tried to leave McDarby after he was born, but got beaten for her efforts. However, when McDarby took the family to Sligo for a holiday a year later, Mary looked out across the Atlantic Ocean and made a big decision. Mary had been secretly saving money, so she bought a ticket to Boston and left Ireland and her life and children behind. Boston was not the American dream for Mary, crushed by guilt and inability to tell anyone the truth about why she was there or what she had left behind. She slipped into a swamp of drink and drugs. After several months in the States, she phoned home to be told that three of her children had been taken into care. Their father had not taken responsibility in Mary's absence and Rory was with Mary's mother. Mary contacted social workers and in the belief that she wasn't ever coming back, she wrote letters saying that her daughters could be fostered and that Andrew could be adopted. She would never see Andrew again. Mary, however, did go back to Ireland. The guilt was too much. At Dublin Airport, rather than being met by a social worker, McDarby welcomed her home with a beating and then raped her. She had become his again, but the children were not. When Mary approached social workers to reclaim her children, they explained that she had abandoned them and she would have to prove that she was a fit mother in order to get them back. Mary told them that McDarby was her stepfather and that he had been abusing her since the age of 10 and they told her that this was unbelievable. Mary decided that she needed to free herself and children from McDarby. She began to find her fight. She contacted the Rape Crisis Center and began to have counseling. Mary became pregnant yet again and gave birth to her daughter, Megan. Her other daughters were returned from care and she began to stake out a life for them, strengthened by the fact that her secret was increasingly coming out into the open. When Mary's counselor invited her to a dinner party, she met Carl. They slowly struck up a friendship and then a romantic relationship. Mary and Carl married and had three children together, a son Dylan and twins, Amber and Nathaniel. Mary said of Carl, it's incredible to me that there are human beings like Carl. He is the most amazing human being with all the children. My children have a role model. There has been a lot of healing in all the relationships. Yeah. Um, because I, I'm not sure how or where it happened, but you met somebody else, mm -hmm. somebody really important in your mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. called Carl. Yeah. Um, and he allowed you the escape patch. Is that fair to say? Or how would you describe yeah. the importance well, of Carl? Well, it was. Uh, uh, the importance of him is that he, he did help me to escape because that man was still around, that man was still threatening. And uh, he was the, I believe my dad sent him to me. Do you really? I do. Your, your, your father, your birth father. To take care of me. You think that? that I do. That's a beautiful thing to say. Yeah, I actually do. Yeah, okay. And he did take care of you. He did. And you got married. Yeah. Mary took a civil case against all the institutions that she claimed that had let her down, which was thrown out of court. She was, however, able to get McDarby to pay damages to her for the years of abuse, which allowed her to purchase her own home and able to train as a psychotherapist. The Manning sisters Ashley, Isilt and Megan obtained records under the Freedom of Information Act showing that their mother had told social workers of the abuse. But despite this, after being placed in foster care, they were returned to Mary with their father McDarby, permitted to have access to them. Isel said, We have been seeking answers for many years as to why we were knowingly placed back into the house of an extremely abusive predatory man by social workers. As an agency of the state, it is their obligation to ensure the safety and well-being of others, especially in circumstances like ours. We still suffer today from the impact of their decision with chronic PTSD, anxiety, fear, a lack of trust in the authority and government agencies, and are in a constant state of hypervigilance. Mary had tried her best to get justice making complaints to not only social services, but also the police. A lengthy file was sent to the director of public prosecutions, but McDarby, who died in 2013, was never charged and did not spend a single day behind bars. 
Daughter Isol said the siblings don't know how their mother survived because every time she reached out, nothing ever happened. Ashley Isolt and Megan lodged papers at the High Court seeking damages from the Child and Family Agency and the Attorney General. The siblings waived their right to anonymity and revealed they were born as a result of rape by their mother being held captive for 20 years. Ashley, the eldest of the three daughters, said, I am angry that no one stepped in to help my mother. She did avail of the rape crisis services, she did talk to social services and police and so did a rapist, but nothing was ever done. Our mother has lived a life of hell and I've no idea how she got through it all. Despite everything, she was able to separate her love for us from the reality of our own conception. Having come about as a result of such brutal rape by her stepfather, Sean McDarby, this makes her an unbelievable person. Sean McDarby was pure evil. The Manning sisters do not refer to Sean McDarby as their dad. Instead, they call him the Irish Joseph Fritzel.